I'm Lucy McBride. I'm a practicing internal medicine physician in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining me tonight, and thank you for welcoming me. Well, welcoming me. Remember last time I called you Mr. Ackerley? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining me in welcoming Dr. Clay Ackerley, who is also a practicing internal medicine physician and a specialist in geriatrics medicine. And tonight we'll be talking about some of your questions that you've written in and we'll have a special focus on school reopening, which is, I think, top of many people's minds. Absolutely. Clay, thanks for joining me tonight. Yeah. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. So it's only Monday, and I feel like, wow, what a week. Oh. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. There's, also, there's so much bad news out there and, and cause for alarm that I think it's easy to get swept up in anxiety and panic and those feelings are valid, but part of what we're trying to do tonight is not to solve the problems of the world, although that would be nice, and not to be able to prescribe to you exactly how to in your school or with your little Johnny what to do, but rather to give you some of the facts, provide you some information that you could use when you're making your own decisions, whether you're a teacher, administrator, staff member, parent, student, grandparent, or just human being, and then to give you some sort of key bullet points that we've thought about as Clay and I have seen patients every day who have school reopening on the top of their mind, and as Clay and I are consulting with a number of DC area schools um, on this very issue. So we, I just got off a call um, with a school and there's a lot to talk about and it's a fluid and very dynamic environment. So we're happy to be here and answer your questions. Clay, Clay, Tell me this, what, what are the, what are your patients saying to you? Um, like if you talk, if you think about parents, like what's the first question they have for you? Or do you want to do go more broad with your- No, I mean, I think it's, I think that's a great question. I think people really just want to know, they want to start planning their lives. Can they count on school or not? And if they can't, then that's big implications for childcare, what their jobs look like, what that means for their children as they get ready for the fall, it's coming up fast. And so that amount of uncertainty is taking a real toll. Unfortunately, I don't think we've got, as, as you mentioned, any easy answers right now. I think I'll just start the conversation by saying, I do believe that the early statements from the American Academy of Pediatrics and some other individuals, Emily Oster being one of them, who basically said, look, we're not going to open schools unless we really, really try and make that a priority to have them open. And I've heard someone else say, you know, eloquently, you know, we do a lot of work to make cars safe, right? And everybody should be able to drive a car once you get a driver's license, but you're not going to put someone into a car that doesn't have brakes or a, uh, a seatbelt. I heard right. that. that so, was our friend. Those are our friends on Twitter, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I've heard um, that. <laughs> so I thought that was a great line. And we just have to um, recognize that this is a fluid situation, work really, really hard to try to get schools open in some form. But just because we're trying really hard doesn't mean we have our eyes closed and aren't aware of some of those risks and investing in mitigating those risks. I think that's right. And I think you know, the, the big uncertainties here are obvious, but I'll just state them. One is that no country has opened when a virus is surging like this, like it is in the, in the United States. So it's just, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, at the same time, we have quite a lot of data from overseas and lots of data about kids and adolescents and how they do with the virus. Um, and you know, the other problem is that, as you know, the World Health Organization has agreed, and we all know that the virus is airborne. It's, it's largely spread by droplets, right? The, the larger droplets that come from our sneezes and coughs that fall with gravity within six feet from our person. But it's also spread by aerosol, which is this little mist or cloud that's invisible around us when we sneeze or cough or talk. Like if I am, you know, talking now and I talk really loudly, ask my husband, um, it's, it's more of a cloud that if carrying little viral particles can be, um, can be problematic. And so as we already, so we know that probably the most dangerous place to be is indoors with poor ventilation, crowded. 
but we also are working hard, you and I are, and school administrators are at using that knowledge to inform the very careful decisions that schools are gonna make. But I think you're right, Clay, the, the, the big point is if, if you don't pressure test the ideas, if you don't have the stake in the ground that we're gonna try to open, then, then you don't pressure test the ideas, you, you just give up. So yep. I think, as Emily Osser said, we have to be nimble and realize that we may change. My son, I have three kids, one's going off to college. And as I said to someone today, you know, they've got a really good plan up in Connecticut. Um, it sounds really good. I want him to be in school. I believe it's good for his emotional health, his, his development. Um, also, he's hopefully gonna learn a few things in college, um, but he also might be home in a week. So, you know, I have a, I, I, don't, I don't count on anything anymore. I have hope and optimism, but hope is at the same time is not science, as we say. Um, so tell me what you know, Clay. I mean, we share the knowledge, but I'd love to hear you t say it because you're so smart about the evidence on kids and, and how they do if they get sick and how much they are transmitters and younger versus older. Could you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, I think my understanding now, and it continues to evolve, we do have a solid foundation to show that they have a harder time getting sick. If they get sick, they have a harder time getting seriously ill. Although the multi-system inflammatory disorder is unique and scary, and I, my child has not had it, and I don't want to say that this is not something to worry about, but it's something for which we have treatments. And the mortality rate for young children in particular is extraordinarily low. Right? They also have a harder time transmitting the virus. And those are things that really go in the favor of trying to open schools in that it's not like having a group of 50 year olds in a room sitting six feet apart, even wearing masks. That said, there is absolutely a risk that if someone has the virus, uh, as a student, as a young student, it is possible that they could spread it, right? It is not zero. So we need to recognize that, particularly as we think about the risks that teachers are taking on. Uh, Absolutely. Being in, being in person. Yeah, I think we've decided that the worry so much is not child to child spread or child to teacher spread. Yeah. It's really teacher to teacher, you know, adult to adult, administrator to administrator, um, staff to staff, it's really that. And so it's not, as you said, that kids can't get the virus. It's not that they can't get very sick. It's just they, they, they don't often. Yep. And I just want to make a little side note here because I've been getting a number of calls from patients and, and, and concerned parents naturally saying, yeah, but if the risk is still there and the risk of death for children is still there, like how can you possibly even send them at all? And my answer to that is, look, Death is not something we're looking for or want, but just like in our everyday lives, we take risks. This is clearly a unique situation, unprecedented, but we do take risks every day, whether we know it or not. And we take, take into account the potential benefit of the decision we're making and the risk. And I do think that if you weigh, of course it depends on the situation and we're gonna go into more detail in a minute. But if you do a really good job, job of tacking down those risks and mitigating the risks, then the benefits are, are, can be there. Now we talk about relative risk and we talk about absolute risk. Will Siegel, who's one of my favorite teachers at St. Albans, one of Henry's mentors, physics, musician, and just a great around, all around guy, asked me about L absolute risk versus relative risk. Yeah. And it's impossible to, to talk about absolute risk, right? And the level of certainty because things are changing every day, right? Like we are getting information minute to minute and making decisions based on information that's changing all the time. But we do know, and I mean, this is a long sentence, so I'm gonna pivot back to you in a second, but we do know that kids need to be in school. And if we, if we do it safely and maybe, you know, half and half staggered, you know, enter entry and start times and with all of the precautions we're gonna go into, that the benefits are enormous. I mean, the kids 
for their social emotional development for the economy, I think McKinsey estimated that 24, I think it was 24 million Americans, I wrote it down here, required childcare to work. Now, that is something that that's something that parents are thinking about, right, more than teachers. But I, I just have to say that out loud. And then think about the kids who get left behind who need schools for food, safety, and for structure, and you know, for all the emotional and, and concerns. I mean, we know that kids of color are disproportionately affected by when schools are not open. And we know that poor kids suffer more. So there are lots of socioeconomic reasons we need to open schools. But I can't remember what my original point was, but I would just say that we can't, we have to know that when we open schools, there will be cases. Absolutely. Because if we go into it saying it's zero tolerance for a case of COVID, which is frankly impossible in the world right now, then we just won't open. So we have to work on mitigating risk aggressively and also mitigating our anxiety about it by following the science. Absolutely. I mean, you have to expect it. So as we think about laying out a plan to open schools, keep them open, but also what does that plan look like to close them? You need to have situational awareness and you have to be ready to pivot, as you say, when you see that first case. How quickly can you act on that information to keep the rest of the school safe, give everybody confidence that what we're seeing, that is the end of it for now, and then get things back going again. Because if a single case is gonna shut the school down, you might as well to shut it down now and plan for complete remote learning, which as noted is certainly not ideal both from a child development perspective and an economic perspective. I think that's right. Um, so I can hear through the camera, <laughs> my patients who are faculty, <laughs> staff, administrators, yep. and, and particularly anxious, not that we aren't entitled to anxiety right now. Anxiety is part of the human condition. We are threatened by a virus. We are wired for survival and our anxiety is, you know, the adrenaline and cortisone is, is coursing through our veins. So I can hear a number of my patients and, and friends talking to me and saying, okay, wait a minute. So you're willing to risk our lives for the sake of your kid. Why would we do that? And I think that is an excellent, excellent question. And so the first thing I'd like to say, or the, the next thing I'd like to say, because I've been talking a whole lot, is the priority right now is on faculty, staff, adult protection. The, obviously, we're, we're working on protecting the kids, but again, the kid-to-kid -kid transmission, the kid-to-adult transmission is not the problem. It's, it's the adults that we're the most worried about. So maybe we want to talk a little bit about what we're thinking about doing, you know, when we talk to the schools we're consulting with, and I'm consulting for a number of them, as you know, um, and then what we're seeing that has, has worked overseas and how feasible those things are. Do you want to talk there a little bit? That's great. I think I will, I will turn, I'll pass the baton back fairly quickly uh, because I will be honest in that those, those talking points aren't right at the tip of my tongue or fingers. I would That's say- That's why I passed it to you. Pardon? That's why I passed it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think just that recognition is really important in the planning process. And so finding ways to make sure that teachers do have the option to teach from home. I think there's been a lot of uh, academic focus or talking about how do you hire proctors and other individuals to come in who are younger, are less likely to be impacted if they were to catch coronavirus, and could they help in terms of some of the on-site presence? I think that is a very interesting and important idea. How do you make sure that if you decide to keep classrooms sort of stable and have homerooms and the kids don't move, the teachers move, making sure that the teachers are able to move safely, you know, between rooms. And honestly, it's a lot about PPE and personal protective equipment and making sure that that is fully available. And I think just the understanding that a lot of the risk does come from the other adults, then you change your behavior as a teaching, as a teacher cohort to say, we're not going to congregate in the ways that we used to, and we're going to be particularly careful amongst each other and as well as, you know, with students. So I think that, you know, is a few things off the top of my head. I imagine. Yeah, no, that's exactly others. right. I think it's important, again, I just want to say it again, that the, the, the priority 
needs to be on faculty, staff, adults, administrators, cafeteria staff, you know, everybody on that campus that is an adult is the top priority. Obviously the kids are a priority, but the prior, because kids don't get that sick and kids aren't at highest risk. So that is a big priority. It's an appropriate focus on where the risk is, right? Yeah, that's where the risk is. So then we, we move to where the risk is. Yeah. So I think, go ahead. I mean, this may be, you may want to come to this a little bit later, but I also think there's been a discussion on how do you make sure that the kids, teachers as well, but also children do not bring the virus in. And I know that we had just talked about, yes, child to child, less of an issue, uh, child to teacher, less of an issue, particularly in from the international data. And a lot of this was pulled together by, you know, a friend and colleague of ours who did a lot of research in this area, that in normal classroom settings, it is hard to pass the virus between students and a lot of these international schools are just not seeing it. It doesn't mean you can't pass the virus in other sorts of situations. A scrum of a bunch of young you know, kids playing together, probably gonna be a high risk environment. Nice and it's use tough of the to word educate scrum, and, and, by the way. Pardon? Nice use of the word scrum. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna um, take that away. <laughs> so, right. so then how do you make sure that there's the responsibility that you don't bring the virus on the campus? And right. placing some of that with the students and the parents to do screening at home. And you'll see probably a lot of businesses that are doing temperature screening at the point of entry to a school. I understand that a lot of those guns are inaccurate. Definitely, it's going to be too late for at least half the cases, right? So spreading, this is one of the things that makes SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 such a problem is the pre-symptomatic spread. So you're going to miss those people who are truly pre-symptomatic. You may get lucky that, okay, they started getting pre-symptomatic on Friday night. They show up on Monday morning and now they're having a fever and you catch them. But at least an oral temperature that can be done at home uh, is going to be more accurate. So how do you place some of the onus on families to keep their children from coming in if they know something's up? But that also puts a lot of burden to say, okay, I was not planning to have to have childcare. And now, you know, Johnny's home with me today. Right. Why is it always Johnny, by the way? I said Johnny. That's a great too. question. I have no, no idea Johnny. why it just popped into my head. No, but it's always Johnny. <laughs> All the Johnnies out there, like, we're not picking on you. Um, so I think it's important to point out that, that overseas we can learn a lot. We can learn what to do and what not to do. So Denmark and Norway have, have opened schools. And importantly, they have not seen an increase of cases. They also didn't see a lack. Of, they also didn't see that the, the closures of schools early on change the course of the caseload. So that's interesting. Um, here's what they, they did though, is they didn't open when the, in, in a location in those countries where the virus was surging. So, you know, the first thing to look at is what is your community case rate like? What is the percent positive rate? What is the hospitalization rate? How are your hospitals doing? So, you know, for example, just like I wouldn't go to Disney World right now, I probably wouldn't want to open a school in Florida. Godspeed for those of you who are trying to go to school in Florida or teach in a Florida school. It just, it would, to me, just off the bat, be more, much more complicated for obvious reasons. Um, but if your community spread is low or going down, that's, those are, you know, it's hard to say optimal conditions, but those are better conditions than when the community, when the community spread is going up. And as you said, we need to think about the community, not just the, the, the city or the district or the, the, the county you're in, but, but also like your school community. How much trust are you putting in to your families? And this is where the messaging has to be really, really good. And um, on, on, on how much your behavior outside of the walls of the school matters. And so one of the things I'm going to do, as I think you know, is talk to a whole bunch of parents of upperclassmen about, you know, hashtag no is the new yes. Yes, Johnny, or, you know, Susie, Susie <laughs> want to go to the party yeah. on a Friday night in someone's basement without masks. I know certain of my children would want to be at that party, um, but this is not the time. This is not the time. And first of all, you're risking the faculty's health. You're risking all the administrators' health. You're risking school shutting down. 
And let's face it, you don't want to be the family that gets coronavirus and then you find out it's because Susie had a party, right? I mean, <laughs> but we have to we have to be airtight on the messaging. It must be that, top of mind for you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> you know, shame, oh, you. Yeah, yeah. shame is not a motivator until until it is sometimes. Absolutely, you know it's, it's can, all about you can, minimizing you can, regret, right? I don't want to have to shame you. I don't want to have. We don't want to have to have regret. So let's talk about. Let's play it out. And what it, what it might look like. What would it look like if you saw your grandmother without a mask inside in a nightclub? First of all, that'd be really weird. But second of all, if you killed her, you'd probably feel really bad, right? I mean, we're having, we're not, we're not total dorks, but we are having conversations like that. Let's play out these scenarios. Yeah. Um, okay, so Denmark and Norway can teach us interesting lessons that when you really, really mitigate risk aggressively, that, and your case rate is going down, that you can do well, and they're continuing to do well, as far as I know as of today. Um, places like Israel, where they opened, when the case rate was going up and then promptly relaxed the distancing measures and the masks, they're doing badly. I mean, it's something, there are a lot of different examples you can point to on either side there to say, okay, yes. this is a good idea or a bad idea. I do think as you think about the measures you are putting into place to protect the schools, the faculty and the students, the measures absolutely either succeed or fail by the sheer number of people you think could be positive, right? Uh, even the mitigation measures of keeping people out, that may capture some percentage of them. Then if the, the student comes into school, it's very unlikely that they would then interact with the teacher long enough or another student. If you set up cohorting, there are lots of these different steps that I'm not sure we really need to go into tonight, but a lot of people thinking about you know, how do you set up a Monday, Tuesday cohort, smaller classroom versus a you know, week by week cohort. Yes, physical distancing is really important. But if suddenly you're dealing with a likelihood of 10, 15 students have it versus one, and maybe they pass it on to one other person, suddenly those, those mitigation steps just are likely to fail. That's so right. I, I think I understand why a place like LA County may say, hey, we gotta go distance learning right now because there are a decent amount of cases, plus there are a lot of resources that have to go into these mitigation steps and they just, haven't seen a way through, I guess. I haven't seen their press release about, you know, their decision making, but I can understand why some have decided not to. Well, I think, I mean, it's LA and San Diego County, they have both decided to do fully distance learning because, as you said, the volume of kids and the lack of resources to, to, to have extra buses, to have extra space, to have extra protective gear, and then to have testing um, in the public school system is just not feasible. And, you know, without making any political commentary you know it just this is a sign of the you know we need we need major major leadership here um we need a consolidated coordinated effort um to protect you know i think of the teachers as the front line i mean they are the front line like you and i are front line for communities and the for health and, the, and then and then for our patients but these are front line workers and they need to be protected so the things that the things that you know most schools are thinking about to mitigate risk. I mean, an analogy I use is the Swiss cheese analogy, where if you take a single slice of Swiss cheese, you look and you see holes. If you slice them, slice them. If you stack them on top of one another, you can't see the holes, right? So you stack mitigating risks. You stack risk mitigating factors onto one another. Gosh, it's been a long day. I can't even <laughs> talk. Um, but one is, mask wearing, I mean, I think it should be a ma mandatory nationally, um, but we can save that for another time. I think it should be mandatory in schools. I mean, we know that masks protect us and other people, protect other people more than us, protect, keep our germs to ourselves. So that has to be mandatory. Um, the idea of being outside as much as possible. Um, one of our medical partners here is telling me that in Texas, God love them in Texas, um, they are one of the universities, they're having every kid have a, uh, like one of those portable chairs, you know, that to be able to do class outside. Right. Um, because we know that outdoor, the outdoors is much safer than indoors. You're much more likely to get infected indoors than outside. Yeah. Um, obviously those, those are space considerations that not every school has. If you're in New York city, you probably don't have like wide open fields to use. Um, and then social distancing is key. So six feet apart, six feet keeps us from spreading those particles, you know, 
to yeah. person to person, and then careful hand washing and hygiene. Ventilation. Do you want to talk about the ventilation systems in schools? And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm not familiar with the details of the science, other than if you just the number that's thrown around is the number of cycles per hour of total air, right? And how frequently can you exchange the air in a particular room? That is extraordinarily important, particularly if you think about, I and mean, we, we don't really know the extent of aerosol spread, but we know some of it is, is, is happening. And so if you can just exchange those aerosols relatively quickly, that type of transmission is not gonna happen. And going back to the Swiss cheese you know, analogy, you, know, you need to have a fairly big aperture or Swiss cheese hole to really get infected for most people, right? And so, so let's, let's stress slowly, that, yeah. So, you know, it's not a single particle for the people who are anxious and say, okay, is there a pathway of a single virus hitting me in the eyes or the nose or the mouth, and then I'm gonna get sick? Almost certainly not, right? Your, your innate immune system will take care of that, either die on its own or you'll take care of it before it becomes a problem. So just reducing as much virus as possible is what you need to do. So ventilate the room. In addition, filters. You know, I haven't seen a randomized control trial or a good epidemiologic study of HEPA filters. We talked to infectious disease experts and infection control experts, and yes, HEPA standard does clear out viral particles of this size. Yeah. And so if you put a really nice HEPA filter in the corner and don't let air flow into it, Right, then it's not going to do much. But I think it can, in addition to really good ventilation systems, if you're stuck in an old room, I will admit in my exam rooms, I have HEPA filters. So just, just stacking on those mitigation steps so that right. if there's a little cough that goes around a mask, you'll know in a couple of minutes, A, it'll spread around because you're in a bigger room, you have fewer people in it, and the HEPA filter will also help reduce some of those particles. So I like them a lot, even though they're not proven, I feel like it just makes common sense. And then I believe if you, if you agree with me that, that, that it's, a, it's a myth, and we talked to our epidemiology colleague at NIH about this, Clay, that you, you're not gonna spread virus through you know, air conditioning ducts and ventilation ducts. That's just, that's just not a thing. Yeah, I mean, I think the air goes up, but almost certainly before it gets to another room, Right. If you just look at the majority of air flows, it will hit a filter before it gets recirculated. Right. Right. So like you, I have, I don't think I have it in front of me, but I have it in my exam room. I have these goggles because um, the goggles help protect us from getting virus into our eyes, obviously. Did that need to be even stated? Um, so right, the masks protect us from infecting other people, protect other people. The goggles protect us from one of the three entry points of the virus, which is you know eyes, nose, mouth. Even better when you're in a high risk situation, and I'm wearing these every day now, is the face shield. So you had demonstrated those at our last tete a tete. Yep. Um, I'm wearing a face shield every day that funnily enough says face shield <laughs> on it, as if like sure I thought about a is? toaster yeah. or something. Yeah. But anyway, it says face shield on it to make it clear that, the, that that's my face shield. But why do I wear a face shield? Because the mask protects you, the face shield protects me. And then the goggles under it protect me too, but I can't always do all yeah, that. And the, and the evidence for the face shield is pretty strong when it comes to droplet, right? Yep. I mean, even just logically you would think, okay, there's this gigantic hole in the bottom. If there's a waft of viral particles, yes, could it come up? And that's why you know, having a mask, have it laying on the outside of the mask, you have to be careful about your mask um, and just making sure you're not touching it when you're taking it off and, and all those things. But a face shield for droplets that are large, typically going down, if someone sprays up, you got, a, you got an arc to it, is a great yeah. way to prevent, particularly if you don't have control over your environment, if someone just were to sneeze in front of you by mistake. I, right. I, I find it intuitively um, very helpful and the data bears it out on droplet. So for schools, I mean, I'm, I'm suggesting as you are, I think to, for teachers to have face shields in addition to the mask, yep. masks protecting the kids from them and then the face shields protecting them from the kids. And then in addition, 
some sort of plexiglass barrier in very you know common areas like at the front desk you know the library where obviously we're not going to be crowding in the library there's going to be space you know, you know limitation of, of who can go how many people can go into one room hopefully at schools um but but the point is that any barrier like that just adds you know layers of the swiss cheese um so I think it's important to stress what you said earlier, Clay, that if you layer these mitigating factors on, onto one another, distancing, masks, face shields for teachers, plexiglass barriers in common areas, um, hand washing, I can't, believe, I can't remember if I said that already, um, and you do not bring into school, you, you try not to bring into school kids who are, you know, have been in a high risk situation, like had to fly somewhere to grandma's, you know, birthday party, um, which they, by the way, they shouldn't be doing anyway, then the risk is really, 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 really low. I think I'm hearing this just, you know, anecdotally, but I'll just say it, you know, if you are a teacher and you've, you've been, you know, on summer break, so to speak, and you've been in your home quarantining, going to the grocery store once a week and you're reading the news, it kind of makes sense to me that you'd be terrified if you're, and someone said to me, well, you're probably just inured to it because you're going to work every day. I'm seeing patients every day. I would not say I'm inured to it at all. I would say that I'm now confident that the mitigating layers work. So it's not that I'm inured. It's not that I'm going to go, you know, running around and, and without a mask. It means that I am very confident that these things work. I mean, you and I both have been doing hand washing distancing, we have a good ventilation system, we're pre-screening patients before they come in, yeah. in the exam room, when we can do that, when we're doing the face-to-face -face visit, which, you know, would, is closer than what a student teacher would be doing. Um, it's brief, masked, face shield, and you're out. Yeah. Cleaning before and after, and I mean, look, I'm an, I'm N of one, but I haven't gotten sick. If you look at, you know, the Harvard hospitals in Boston, you know, they are doing extremely well because of all the same mitigating factors. Now, people will say back to me, teenagers are not like doctors. They do not behave like that. And that is true. But this is where culture and communication Absolutely. and a message that's clear and unified, which by the way, we need nationally, can I say that again, has to come from the school leadership on what we expect our you know, inhabitants of this, of this yeah. school to behave, how, they, how to be. And I think, and honestly, Lucy, right, when, when you have built second tier, almost certainly been effective distance learning program, and you can toggle back and forth, whether or not that's on a school-wide basis, classroom basis, cohort basis, individual basis, I do think it gives probably the teachers who are worried about one or two students who they know they spend a lot of energy trying to, you know, corral one way or the other to say, you know what, you're not suspended. We're not going to impact your learning per se. You just have to go home until, you know, you behave in an appropriate way. And so I think if you can build that layer, whether or not it's someone who has a high risk family member wants to be in distance learning the entire time, or it's someone who's got a family member who gets sick and need to quarantine uh, with that household, or it's someone who isn't taking these steps that are required and the responsibility necessary to be in classrooms. Now, I think it's probably an easier sell for high school. How do you do that for elementary school? And, um, but I will defer to the parents of children of, of that age about whether or not that uh, is even feasible. But I do think that once you put those steps in place, you have to be fairly confident that they will be followed not that if a single student takes off their mask in a room and sneezes, that suddenly the entire room is going to get coronavirus. That is right. why the teacher should wear a face shield. Students should be feel free to wear a face shield. You're wearing a mask. Yes, it does help you. It's not just about protecting others, but it definitely protects others. Yeah. So you know, for those one-off moments that may be anxiety provoking, yes, we hope to minimize those, but it doesn't suddenly mean that everybody uh, will get infected. One of the questions that's coming in is if child to child transmission isn't an issue, and by the way, I would say it's not, it's not a zero, it's, it, it does happen, but if, if it's not an issue, let's say we say it's not an issue, 
how do we explain the outbreaks at camps, summer camps and daycares? What would you say to that, Clay? And I mean, it's all speculation at this point, but I tell yeah, me honestly, I've not seen the data on um, right. on camps, and I think I saw some of the early data on daycare, and it is a different environment than a school in terms of you now camps. Again, I don't, I don't, I honestly, I can't speak to it. Yeah, but well, just you also have to remember that some of the data on camps is coming from camps that never opened because so hmm. daycare remember you know you can have you can have infections in daycare because of adult to adult, adult transmission right so and, and it's a lot of adults on top i mean working very closely together uh -oh. i don't know if i have so this every, so i'm not saying that we necessarily do this Am I, am I, did my internet go bad for a second? Oh, my I think so, or mine did. One of ours did. I think it's mine. Okay, okay so um, it's hard to tease out. Emily Oster is trying to do this on daycares. Okay. Um, but just because you have a, a, a daycare outbreak doesn't mean it's child to child, right? It could be from the, you know, faculty and staff there, um, staff to staff. Um, but we, but I mean, there is very, very, very compelling data that the littlest kids in particular are not either getting it or not transmitting it. So I'd have to believe that it was po possibly from the adults. I mean, you, that, that's what the data would tell us. I just yeah. don't think we know yet. I mean, there's a lot of compelling evidence there. Um, another question is, um, with respect to children, what, is, what are we talking about age-wise? Is there a difference between, say, 18-year-olds going off to college versus you know, let's say younger than 16. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I think, I think uh, I can try to pull it up right now. I just saw at least from a mortality perspective. Yeah, I just had that in front of me too. Yeah, I thought you want to read that off. You want me to do it? No, because I don't have it in front of me. Oh, you don't? Okay. So. Oh, from Finland. Oh, interesting. Actually, I have data from, D, from, from the U.S. In May, uh, up until May. Okay, go for it that looking at the cohorts of less than 17 and 17, oh, that's not as helpful. <laughs> Sorry, I got excited again. But like for those less than 17, everybody we're talking about, uh, the mortality rate is less than 0.1%. And again, people are gonna say, okay, less than 0.1%, that's not zero, so I'm not, I can't, I can't do anything, I can't go to school. But that was back when, honestly, it looked like for older cohorts, it was a lot higher and we've gotten a lot better. And we've gotten so much better, yeah. Research. We've gotten a lot better. I mean, I think it's very easy to feel hopeless in this, world we live in right now because it feels like it's never ending the threat is invisible right it's spread by people we don't know who are even sick um but we have learned so much in the last four months six months and we're learning more every day so you know i'm optimistic i i, I want to make it clear though that i'm not someone who's saying and i don't think you are dr ackley either that schools have to open or bust I'm saying that it is possible if we do it really, really thoughtfully and carefully and following the science and the evidence, and it includes schools not looking at all like what they looked like last spring. So, you know, we are, you know, both, as, as many experts are, including American Academy of Pediatrics and other expert groups, um, recommending some in-person learning, but I may change my mind on that if the science and the evidence changes. Yep. So it's not that Clay or I are, are, you know, we're following the science and the evidence, and it is possible. Um, I so, think so, absolutely. Um, let me look at some other questions that are coming okay. in. Um, let's see, hold on a second. Should parents wear masks at home once kids return to school? Because they're worried spreading? about the children giving the parents coronavirus. That seems a little extreme. It totally depends, I think, if on a number of scenarios. If you're really, really high risk and you believe that your child may be a little on the older side, but you're talking middle school to high school, you've got less true understanding of what their behaviors are in school and out of school then maybe, or if there suddenly is a small number of cases in that child's school, but they're still open, maybe a little bit more nervous, but that, that seems 
It seems unnecessary. It seems, it seems completely unnecessary to me. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's worth talking a little bit now about like what happens when a kid gets sick at school. And of course, we cannot speak to every school. We cannot speak to every state, right? Because every every school is different. Every every there are different contours of the situation. I mean, there are different contours to each clinical situation. I'm talking on the phone as you are all day long with patients with you know this symptom, that timing of, a, of potential exposure, this particular risk, and this you know other je ne sais quoi. And so to make broad general generalized statements is just impossible and also would be totally irresponsible. That said, I think it's worth saying that, you know, there is such a thing as a, as a, as a, as a close contact. Yeah. And then there are contexts of contacts that are not considered yeah. close. So when a kid gets sick, let's talk about, let's take away school for a second. Let's just talk about when someone gets sick in your family. Um, when, when someone gets sick in your family, then we, we assume, and, and, and then let's say, then what does that mean you're sick? You either have a positive COVID test or the pediatrician has a high index of suspicion that you have COVID despite negative testing. As we know, the testing is not great. Yeah. So if you have, you know, it smells like a duck, looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it's a duck. Yeah. So that's a positive case. Then those family members, because they're close contacts, right? They're not wearing masks because they shouldn't in a family, like unless, yeah. Um, then those people need to quarantine for 14 days and the contact, the, the index case, the kid who's sick needs to be home for 10 days, right? Yep. So the question I get a lot is, okay, Johnny, let's go back to Johnny. Let's pick on Johnny again. Johnny's <laughs> teammate Johnny. who's been playing lacrosse all summer with him on a field outside, not masked, got sick. Johnny's not sick. Johnny's friend got sick. Does Johnny, what does he need to do? Well, I would say that he needs to consider quarantining depending on the, the contact and how close he was. If he was in an outdoor field and never touched the guy, then he doesn't need to quarantine. But if he was close up and felt a mist of spread, you know, upset, <laughs> yes. But the parents and the family yeah. do not need to quarantine. But it depends on the situation. And I might mask up that family if the contact from Johnny's friend was high risk. So it just depends, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, 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 that example just highlights the challenge that we're all feeling the anxiety of, of how can you judge, right? I mean, the CDC guidance on a high risk contact of less than six feet unmasked for greater than 15 minutes is Very both, big. I'm glad they, they put a line in the sand sort of. That's harder than judge because life isn't often like that. And is it, how about, three five minute periods over the course of right. a day and, and right. you can just get yourself tied in knots over thinking about what do I need to do for that child and a lot of this in my mind does come down to testing and we're really hamstrung right now it's getting really optimistic we have a lot of testing capacity in DC and now the time to get the test results back and it's all in the news and it's true it just takes a while and therefore like in the very beginning of the pandemic, when getting a test A was impossible, B, it wasn't all that useful because it took so long that you're basically saying, hey, everybody, if we feel like you've got a high risk contact or you got some symptoms, just quarantine until you feel better and then we'll release you, right? <laughs> I'm actually telling people that now because the testing, as you said, is so long. And if you're willing to trust me that you have COVID because you have no smell and you're coughing, just quarantine. Don't take away someone else's test if you, if you can because we know, you know, you have COVID. Yeah, my hope is, at least as of a couple of weeks ago, there was real optimism that there are a number of technologies that will be coming online in the next two to three months that could change that, right? And so the impact on a family, if they believe that their child is at a high-risk contact, but also think about that child, if they know what the consequences of admitting what they did, there's a lot of incentive to not be truthful. <laughs> so to say, you know what, you know, I, I'd rather not have my big brother really upset at me because he's now stuck at home because I was dumb. Right. Um, and right. so I think, you know, what does that mean? Again, I'm not a, a, a parent of an older child, but I think a lot of hair triggers on saying, okay, we are gonna close down the family for a little bit. If testing's not available, then we'll just monitor temperature and symptoms and you know, do that as you say. Unfortunately, if it's a contact base, that's 14 days. 
Right. So. People have asked me a great question. Why does the person who's sick, either proven or suspected <laughs> COVID, have to be ten isolated days. for 10 days? Yeah. And why do I then have to quarantine for 14 days? That yeah. means longer. Do you have a good explanation for that, Dr. Eggerly? I mean, incubation period. Right. Right. But it doesn't seem all that intuitive. It doesn't. And I've got a, I got a less likelihood of spreading it. Why are you keeping me here longer? Well, right. it turns out you may incubate for a while, then you have symptoms in the 10 day clock and all that. Yeah. I mean, the reason is just more specifically that as you're saying that, that by the time you get a positive taste test, by the time you get a positive test or exhibit symptoms, you've already been contagious for at least 48 hours. So the clock started then, and we don't see much evidence of infectious virus in people eight to 10 days it's really, I think it's eight is what I've seen. And they just tack yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the general rule. Yeah. There are exceptions to that. Of course. There are and exceptions. I think there's sort of two aspects. There is the the long hauler who never clears. And there was a lot of debate about the PCR test. Was that live virus or not? And they're doing viral cultures to say, okay, how long can the virus that they're shedding actually get someone sick? And it does seem like it could definitely be longer than eight days. But the vast majority... Uh, is less than that. And they typically have symptoms along with that. I think another, if, if I, is it okay if I do a quick tangent? Totally. Which is, I hope it's the one I, where I'm thinking about. No, no, actually. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. But I think uh, before I forget, on as we think about these slices of Swiss cheese, right, and the mitigation steps and which ones do you prioritize, there is a fair amount of data that a lot of the spread is from super spreader events. Right. Not like the Washington State choir, right? Exactly. So you're not going to have choir at school. You're going to do everything you can to prevent that from happening. And therefore, I think there is a responsibility for people in their private lives too to continue to try to avoid going to, even though the, what is it, the DC regulations are what, 50 people now? Or they've expanded? Maryland's a hundred. I, I think it's fifty. Yeah. And Maryland's a hundred. I think yeah, that, but I that could be sounds, wrong. You know, of all the things, good for DC for being proactive. We've done a good job. The numbers, while they could be creeping up a little bit, are relatively good compared to the rest of the country right now. Right. Um, that seems a little risky to be having events of that size. Yeah. Right? So the reason I don't know is because I'm not those those events campus, those, yeah. Then I think you're going to do, you know, pretty well. Right. Um, so the, the kid who's sick quarantine or isolates, which is like strict, you know, sort of lockdown in your room, like don't go out in common areas for 10 days, the contacts quarantine for 14 because, or because it can take 14 days to exhibit symptoms after exposure. So if you think about it from a classroom standpoint, let's say a kid in your classroom gets sick and hopefully there are only 10 kids in a well-ventilated classroom with masks, face shields, hygiene precautions, all at play. Technically, if that kid gets sick, technically, let's just be clear that the science would say that everyone in the classroom does not need to quarantine. That's how low risk it is. I just want to be clear that it's not zero. And I'm going to say that I'm going to guess that most people in the classroom are going to want to first know that that kid was sick and take extra precautions and you know, maybe quarantine for 14 days. But again, it is very low risk if you're using all those layers of Swiss cheese. My mnemonic device, can I just talk about this for a second? My acronym for this okay. is, I think I told you about this before, it's called Mosh Pit. Yes, absolutely. So Mosh Pit. Episode one. Episode one. So Mosh Pit is, a, a Mosh Pit is the last place you want to be, right? sweaty at a rock concert with terrible ventilation, maybe terrible music, up close, not where you want to be. But it serves as a handy dandy way of remembering the mitigating factors. At least it does to me and my kids. So one or M is masked, right? All the time, masked. I'm not wearing a mask right now because I'm in a, in a closed room and, but every time I walk out my door, I'm wearing a mask. Um, o is for outdoors. The more you can be outside, the better. And I think as much class as, as can happen outside is, is better. Um, we'll see how it goes, you know, in the winter, but obviously the more you can be outside, but, but the outside, the O is also, you know, about ventilation and the filtration of the air that we talked about already. Yeah. S is social distancing. So it's not that 
coronavirus is a stop sign at six feet, but the data is clear so far that respiratory droplets do not propel beyond six feet. Um, and then H is hand washing and hygiene. Purell, soap and water, the mask, the, 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 the virus is very, very, very wimpy against those things. And then P is for public responsibility. So realizing like my favorite person on the planet right now, Dr. Fauci, next to you and my husband, um, we are thinking about other people. We should think about other people all the time, but particularly right now, like other people matter. We have a public responsibility for others. So wearing a mask is a statement of respect and protection of other people. Um, and then I is information, follow the facts, follow the science, you know, don't get caught up in some of these, you know, myths like, you know, drinking bleach to, you know, purify Thank goodness your body. we're past the bleach stage. Thank God, I mean, yeah, hydroxychloroquine. I mean, there's a good example of like, didn't pan out, right? Um, Advil was like, we thought we couldn't use Advil back in the beginning of the pandemic. Lots of studies have shown that Advil and ibuprofen are okay because I love me an Advil at the end of the day. I might have one tonight. Um, and then T is talk to your doctor. So because each situation is so unique and e there's so many variables in each interaction, right? It's important that you have a doctor you can talk to and go through the, you know, the scenarios. Absolutely. Um, but T is also talk, let's just say this, it's talk to, you know, your family about how you feel. Talk to your pets. Talk to anybody who will listen. Journal. Like, talk out the stress because this is a stressful time. And if you're keeping it all inside, I mean, it, it doesn't look good, right? We're getting people, I'm having so many people have panic attacks, insomnia, you know, surges in high blood pressure, exacerbations of their heart right. disease. Elevated yeah, blood sugars. It's it's you know talking and managing your stress is really to be part of the, the the way we mitigate risk. Yeah, I mean I think particularly when it comes to the impact of COVID on your health period, independent of the virus. Yep. Right. If you just think about that hidden cost, certainly to help you make decision making or help improve your decision making in the moment, so you don't That's a great feel. Point overly anxious about the decision, you use the best evidence, you make a decision, you stick with it. And I am seeing a lot of decision fatigue, people making decisions, then having to make so many and that's fatiguing, or they've made a decision and they're now finding it really hard to stick with. How do you go back, process it? Why did I make that decision about how I'm gonna help run my family under these insane times? Right. So absolutely, I think it's, it's hugely important. And I think, I think it's true in, in pre-coronavirus times as well. Like, we don't want to be making decisions that are driven by anxiety, right? It's natural to have anxiety, but if, if anxiety is in the driver's seat and, and anxiety is making your decisions, then they're not going to be, they're not going to be yeah. rational decisions, right? Um, and so this is why you and I are here, right? Is trying to day to day with our patients and then right now dispense facts, science, you know, hope where we can give it. I mean, yeah. as we both say, like hope is not science, but it's possible to tack this virus down. It's been done, it could be done. We didn't have to be here right now. Yeah. Um, and so we just need we just need to, you know, figure out what matters to us most. And for some people that's gonna be staying home and teaching remotely. And for some people it's sending their kids in and hoping for the best. I'm sending my three kids to school, two to high school, one to college. And it's not because you know, I'm not worried about them being the 0.01%. It's that to me, the benefits greatly outweigh the risk with an understanding that they could be home in a week. And I accept that. Um, but I think it's really important that we identify what is dysfunctional thinking, what is functional thinking. So when I talk to my anxious patients, it's like, okay, what are the thoughts that aren't based in, you know, fact, science, reality? Like, let's pressure check that, like pressure test it. Like what, like talk back to that thought and like, can you play it out? And then what's real? What's a functional thought? Like, you know, I have a sore throat and a fever. Like, okay, yep. that's a, that's, that, that's a thing. But the thought, you know, I'm going to die in my classroom. How could I ever walk out my front door again? That is not a rational thought. Right. And I, I think that happening is really, really low. Right. But right. yeah, I, I think going back to the very beginning, I know we're getting close to the end of time. Yeah, we got to wrap up. I think it's, it's it is crucial that 
the systems that are put into place are, and again, going back to Emily Oster's recent right, communications on this matter, it's gonna take resources. And resources take leadership, and it's really going to punish, unfortunately, those areas without the resources. Totally. You have to make teacher safety a priority. By doing that, you keep the schools open. Yes, you keep the students safe too. It just honestly is a whole lot less likely, if you look at the data, of being a significant issue. So making sure that the teachers are comfortable with the systems that are in place that can and will, you know, keep them safe, but that is where the more likely problems will arise in the school environment. And so. Right. I have such great respect for our ICU colleagues and our ER colleagues around the country, particularly in Houston right now, in Florida. You know, I'm talking to my friends all over the country about their unique challenges. And I really, really have such empathy for our school administrators, faculty, staff, cafeteria workers, the, I mean, all of the people who make up a school because it's really a little city, right? Um, and I, I think it's incredible work that they do. And, you know, we're all, I mean, at the risk of sounding really cheesy, we're in this together, right? We have to work together. And, and I think, you know, their schools that are gonna be, have a very, very hard time opening because of lack of resources. And that is terrible. Um, but I'm also optimistic that if we, do the things we talked about, I mean, if possible. Yeah. It works. So things we'll that see. are outside we'll of our control, right? There are things that are outside right? of our control. Right. Yep. Um, all right, Clay, can I make a little plug about you tonight? <laughs> sure. So Clay Ackerley is the Brad Pitt of virology right now. He is going to be on CNN at 10 o'clock on Don Lemon. Yeah, so I think that's, uh, you know, I think Brad Pitt's the right term in terms of Brad Pitt pay, plays things. I am no virologist. Uh, in terms of the well, reason, okay, you're you're a practicing thought, doctor, yeah. but uh, I do feel a little bit bad about going to. If I can just maybe go thirty seconds over, please. Uh, I published a paper that a lot of people have said is a real downer. Had a patient who caught COVID twice, right? And there are implications of that for what the pandemic would look like. I am still an optimist, right? In terms of what therapeutics are going to bring, I still believe that vaccines will come and will make a big difference. I also worry, based on what I'm seeing, that immunity from catching you know, COVID-19 is not gonna be long lasting. And therefore, those who have caught it, like my patient who caught it, got better, caught it a second time, was sicker, right? We need to be careful as much as people wanna cling to, oh, thank God, I got it, now I don't have to worry, just be careful. But I know that's yeah. sort of a Debbie Downer thing, but I am optimistic. As much as a lot of the news that's coming out is negative, I think we can do this. Well, I think you made a really, really good, I mean, it was an excellent article in Vox. Um, Don Lemon's gonna be talking to you about it tonight. But I think, I think you elegantly and appropriately said, look, this is, this is one case. Um, it's an anecdote. And as our friends like to say, the plural of anecdote is anecdotes. <laughs> Not but yeah. it happened, it happens, right? It happened. So it's worth reporting on, but you make it clear that you know, we don't need to unleash, you know, the panic because of this. At the same time, it's very, very interesting and it does have potential implications for the vaccine, which we can talk about maybe next time at the next uh, Q&A with Lucy and Clay. That's good. Anyway, good luck with Don on CNN and Clay, thanks again. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. That's fun as always. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye.